Hello, my name is Jeremy Zimmerman. If you can't understand that, I have a book where I, they have it written right here, Jeremy Zimmerman, Jeremy with an E. I wrote this book, Make Mead Like a Viking. You are welcome to buy it and read it or steal it or whatever you want to do. But I'm going to show you how to do a part of the mead process right now. I did some earlier videos in the Critical Fun channel and that was only part of the process. I had no idea if or when I was ever going to get to making more, but you people kept watching it. What's wrong with you? You kept asking for more videos and actually wanted me to explain the rest of the process. So I'm going to do that just for you. Are you happy now? So when I started, I made batch of mead I started in an open fermenter. You don't have to do that with every batch you start. I like to start them in the open fermenter but you can't leave it that way for more than a week or two. A couple weeks probably fine if you stir it regularly. Otherwise it turns to vinegar which isn't a huge loss because you can cook with it but I doubt you came here to learn how to make vinegar. So I'll teach you how to not make vinegar. Once it has been in the open fermenter and it's been fermenting for maybe a week or so. That is when I will transfer it to a closed fermenter. These big five gallon jugs here are called carboys in fancy homebrew talk. I also like to do a lot of meat in one gallon jugs. Those are a little easier to work with, they're quicker, they're cheaper, etc. Now, whether you're doing a one gallon jug or a five gallon carboy, even, even if you start it in, in a closed fermenter like this, you're going to rack several times. Now, oh, I, I should explain that. To rack is to transfer from one vessel to another. For some reason, the fancy homebrew folks at some point came up with the term rack. So that's what we're doing now. If you want to talk to your fancy homebrew friends and start talking about your rack, they'll know exactly what you're talking about. So that's what we're going to do today. That five gallon batch I made the open fermenter, I racked into one of these. That, that, that batch has long been bottled in most of the drink. But these are some new batches I have going. And even after you transfer it the first time around, about a month or two into the process, you're going to notice a certain degree of clarification. And this big yeast cake on the bottom, yummy. Some call it lees, L-E-E-S. It's basically a bunch of yeast that has been going crazy and eating up all these sugars and enzymes and having a big old party in there and eventually they just crashed. Some say they're dead. I think they're probably sleeping or ready to be reincarnated for a new batch of mead. So there are a couple of reasons to rack off the lees. Um, one is each time you do it, the mead will become more clear. I usually, for a five gallon batch, I will rack usually three times and then a fourth time to bottle. Some I might rack a little more, but generally three to four times total is more than enough. And each time you do, it's going to get clearer and clearer. This is a batch of one gallon mead that is probably going to be ready to bottle somewhat soon. There's a tiny bit of sediment in the bottom. I may rack it one more time. I may just rack it straight into a bottling container with a spigot on it. If it's a five gallon batch, I'll do something like that one right there. Big five gallon jug or bucket with a spigot on it. So. Those are the various reasons for racking. I'm going to show you how to do the whole racking thing. Now, this one may be a little early to rack. You can see it's still very active, but I want to get it off this yeast cake so it will ferment a little quicker. It'll be done sooner. And 
because the longer it's on there, the more it's just going to keep going. So I'm going to go ahead and rack this one into this one now. You want to use a siphon. You can get these at homebrew stores. You can also get them at a hardware store like Ace Hardware. And just make sure it's something that's designed for water to go through, that it's food, food grade, that sort of thing. And you can use the siphon itself. Get one long enough, just put it in here, put it in there, get a good suck on it, get it going. But these are nice to have. This is called a racking cane. And what you do is you put it in there very carefully. If you just shove it in there, it's going to displace all the meat and it's going to spill over. And you don't necessarily need this funnel, but I find that it helps to kind of contain the tube there. Otherwise, there have been a number of times when I went just straight into that and the tube popped out and I had meat going all over the place. So I'm going to put it just part way in and just slowly and carefully start the process. Kind of push this into there a little bit to make sure it doesn't just pop out on me. And you can see we've already got a good siphon going. Now there have been a few times when this has not been up, up here, up here, the camera up here. <laughs> this part right here can develop an air bubble. Here, here, let me shoot, let me help you. You got it? Okay. <laughs> so that it'll stop coming out and you have to pump it again. Sometimes you may need to shove that up there a little more. There have been a few times where I've just taken it and just thrown it across the room and just started <laughs> rocking with the regular old tube, but I don't recommend doing that. Now, you're going to want to look closely at the carboy here. It's actually probably going to be a little tough to see because it's kind of flat. You notice you want to get this far enough in that it's not touching the yeast cake on the bottom. You're going to end up sucking in a little more of that yeast, that's fine. But if you just plop it all the way down to the bottom, you're going to be pulling up all that yeast that you're trying to get it off of. So just try to keep it right about there. Yeah. Get as close as possible. You want to get as much of this meat as possible into it. But get as much as you can. And if you don't quite reach the neck of the the neck the next jug, carboy, then you can always add some more water or mix some honey and water and add it. Because you want it about an inch or so, about two inches from the opening. You leave too much space there and you could get too much air inside of it and potentially bring off flavors to your meat. So that's really all there is to the process. Uh, one thing I didn't mention, it should be kind of obvious here. It is important that you have the, the primary fermenter, your, your main carboy here, above the other because you're working with gravity. Uh, something about like this 40 pound tub of uh, honey is an ideal thing to use right now. You can use a chair, you can you know, get your wife or your husband to kind of sit there and hold it and complain because it's really heavy. Actually, that's a really bad idea. Don't do that. But something to provide gravity and flow. And that's really about all there is to it. So I will be hopefully doing some more videos, maybe some fairly short ones on just different parts of the process, maybe going into bottling, uh, ways you can fine tune your beads how to drink mead even, or I may not do any of that because I, I really don't like doing these videos. I'm just kidding. This is great. I love it. You people enjoy it. Have a nice day.